Hello, everyone. I'm Darren Brussell, faculty member at the University of Oklahoma, whose specialty is political geography and geopolitics. I'm here to talk about late night humor and geopolitics and how we think about it in today's world. You've, been, you've spent most of the semester, I mean, most of the uh, last few weeks talking about political geography, national identity, territoriality, borders, boundaries, et cetera. You've spent a lot of time looking at this. Professors at uh, universities often take that base and work with it at a different level there. And we're very interested in what we call critical geopolitics. It's a subfield of political geography, and it looks at discourses, specifically the way we talk about and know the world through three sets of processes. In the upper left-hand corner, we talk about formal geopolitics. These are the grand visions of how a country is going to carry itself and what its concerns should be around the globe. You think about scholars and think tanks that influence governments. To the, to the right is practical geopolitics, the relationships between countries and how we maintain trade and trade, how we maintain trade relationships, diplomatic relationships, and even defense relationships with our allies. This, top, this talk is going to talk mostly about what we call popular geopolitics, the way that the ideas and the practices of formal and practical geopolitics show up in our popular culture and our media. One of my, my area of specialties is, is looking at um, humor and laughter. And let's talk a little bit about why humor works. You know, humor is funny, so we should ask, so what? The first paragraph is a quote from Hobbes in which he talks about, in Old English, mind you, he talks about the fact that laughing at people who don't necessarily have the same capabilities is not something that should be done. It's, it's not even funny there. He talks, in making that point, many scholars have made the point that humor is about power and setting yourself up in many ways to be better than others. Humor scholar Christy Davies, though, makes the point that jokes are not necessarily that important in some ways, that they're a thermometer, not a thermostat. They don't necessarily have causal power, so he argues. So why would geographers study this to begin with? Well, as, prof as Professor Yuha Riedenpa, a uh, Finnish, uh, Finnish geographer, says, if we think about how important a part of humor plays in people's everyday lives, for instance, how people form their conceptions of the modern world through media, in which humor is constantly present, it is obvious that some need or even imperative for further study exists there. Think about the way you, as a student, kind of use humor. It's the way you help you, you identify with friends, you, it forms bonds, it forms groups. You may tell jokes about um, rival schools, football teams, or academic teams, or whatever competition you've got. And you often tell you know, jokes are often used sometimes about your teachers and maybe your principals. But let's also be honest, sometimes they joke about you guys too. If humor is about power in some ways, and some, sometimes resisting that power. And we use it in so much of our life, and particularly in our popular culture, our television, our movies, our means, we have to look at it. And that's what many scholars are looking at. If we think about humor in geopolitics and how we think about it, you'll see a lot of research that goes on, takes a look at how humor is used to maintain national identity or even survive day to day in very serious situations where there is danger. There's research on Afghanistan and how jokes were that were used to deal with the issues of American soldiers and Afghan nationals and how they cooperated with each other, knowing that they're not the same people. Um, a second set about dark humor and narrative and regional belonging goes into the idea of nation building and ethnic identity there. And if you've ever seen the Onion um, Atlas of the World, you get a very you get a very clear view of what history and international relations humor can be like. And if you're a fan of uh, a new sh of, of shows like Archer, even the, even the issue of what you name the spy agency that Archer and his, his uh, peers work in is, is part of, can be problematic. It used to be called ISIS. And then when ISIS developed in Southwest Asia and North Africa, uh, they had to change the name. The sh they had to name, change the name of the uh, of the uh, agency they worked for there. So we find geopolitical content in all sorts of political, excuse me, popular culture uh, shows and memes. So why look at late night humor? 
Well, a couple of reasons. It's widely consumed. Um, a few years ago, as many as 10 million people would have been watching late night comedians like Stephen Colbert, Samantha B, Trevor Noah every night, especially during ratings areas where they're, they're trying to get high, high ratings to sell to advertisers there. Plus, you also share it on YouTube. You share it in your memes. You, you share it in your tweets and such. And so this is important to consider. In the early 2000s and late 1990s, there was growing acknowledgement of political power uh, via late night humor. So presidential candidates made a point to be on these shows, to be seen as a little more approachable, a little more laugh. Uh, they, could take a, they could take a joke essentially there. There's media coverage of late night comedians jokes. The New York Times, the Washington Post, and even the Oklahoman will run jokes from the late, from the comedians uh, that, that were told the night before on their front pages just to make the point. But I'm going to make the argument that late night humor is part of a larger constellation of media practices that kind of shape our geopolitical imagination. Essentially, they reinforce what we think we know about the world around us. Now, late night humor does have certain limitations to it. It's hard to joke about international issues because as this quote from Jay Leno, a retired uh, and former very famous host of the NBC Tonight Show, used to make the point that the audience has to know what you're talking about or else you'll be sunk. The host can't know more than anybody watching. And we've found that once you get past Secretary of State, and even that's a stretch, no one knows what you're talking about. Now, in a world in which we are focused mostly on our own country, if you tell jokes about other countries, it requires that the audience really has some knowledge there, but often they don't, and we often fall back into using stereotypes. There is a theory of humor called superiority theory in which we tell jokes about others. We talk about other nations, other ethnicities, other groups, and stereotypes often become the basis of that humor there. So we may not learn much from the late night comedians, but it definitely reinforces things we think we know already. Editors and comedians have to make the choices of what's going to go into the five to 10 minute monologue. Once they do that though, and they tell the jokes, they reproduce the very frameworks that the journalists have put into their stories about whether Rwanda was a tribal conflict or, or Yugoslavia was a civil war or any other framing that we have that tries to tell the world you know, whether a place is modern, civilized, et cetera. Again, so the, the, this, this graph shows the fact that journalists and comedians actually kind of work with each other and they easily, easily, to, they easily reproduce uh, the world we see often in serious news in our late night humor. I wanna talk a little bit about a case study here. In this case, we're gonna talk about how China has been portrayed for during a 20 year period from the late 19, mid, excuse me, mid 1990s to the mid 20 teens there. Um, China has been a very interesting country for the United States to think about because there's, we have a lot of trade connections, some cultural connections there. And the, China's economic rise and geopolitical rise and geopolitical importance has been a concern for many around the globe there as it starts to flex its muscle around the globe. The, the, the jokes come from a LexisNexis database called the Daily Front Runner. This is a service that used to send um, updates about overnight news to businesses and government agencies. They used to do it by fax, today it's done by email there. When we were collecting this database, over 58,000 jokes were, were, were uh, scraped and we used text only, no video. In searching that 58,000 uh, jokes, we had to go through and look for specific terms, China, Chinese, China's major city names. We talked, we looked for Olympics, references to Tiananmen, um, we'll explain that in a moment, uh, Taiwan, and the lead names of uh, various Chinese leaders there, which gave us a final data set of about 875 jokes, okay, all told during that 20 year period. Now, if anybody's thinking about taking the AP research course, and I hope you are, you have to think about how you would try to classify these jokes. You can't just, you don't wanna just describe them all. Um, so we have to think about coding them and saying, what are they really joking about there? 
So these jokes often get multiple codes um, because these jokes through what we call incongruity theory sometimes are bringing in multiple themes into the joke. It's not just an easy joke to kind of repeat and, and look at. Uh, so sometimes there's as many as four codes there. And we also looked for locations mentioned in the jokes other than China and US um, here. So, and many of the codes that came out, we talked about the fact that many of the jokes hit late night humor, especially if a president's traveling to China, if they're wanting to make a joke about a US president, uh, China is just a setup, it's a backdrop. You know, the, ch the president's going to China and they start telling a joke about the president there. We'll talk about campaign issues, that becomes an issue. And in the jokes, the dominant code is China's economic rise and the idea of a perceived threat. Um, human rights becomes an issue, food, economic outsourcing. So you, you've heard about deindustrialization, or you will in the economic geography section. And the perceptions of, of culture and government, how those differences exist between the two countries. So let's jump in and take a look at a couple of the specific themes here. This word cloud gives us an idea of the, the most the words that showed up the most in the uh, joke data set of the, of the China jokes there. And obviously China's there, but economics since it shows up a great deal. Economic shows up a great deal. And if you look to the far right, espionage shows up. So there's real concerns about um, relations between the two states that show up in the jokes. The word investment in the right hand side shows up, making the point that even comedians are joking about how much investment the two countries have in each other. Uh, a campaign was a big issue there in the late 1990s there. Various leaders like Gore and Clinton and Bush show up in the word cloud there. But things like technology and human and outsourcing also show up a great deal there. So we can get a little bit of a feel for the themes just by looking at a word cloud. When we did our um, when we did our uh, study of this, there's no surprise that the China, we mentioned the idea of uh, the jokes, um, if they're mostly about a president who's going to China, it had nothing to do with China, it's just that they were going there because of China setup. But if you take a look at the uh, categories in bold, these are very important ones. Uh, the, the ones, the, uh, to the left side of the graph for the largest number of jokes told, um, U.S. economic issues, China, in China's investment in the U.S., their economic rise. These are all important things to have in here. Um, Tiananmen Square shows up just a little bit. That goes back to human rights. And then oddly enough, and perhaps no surprise anybody who knows anything about um, China, pandas show up as part of the jokes a good deal as well. So let's take a look at specific jokes and take out how they how they how they kind of how what they were expressing about U.S. concerns over China. There, there was a Democratic campaign scandal in the late 1990s in which Chinese um, monks were trying to get money into the Democratic National Committee there and try to improve China's image in the U.S. if not influence policy there. And to make that point with terminology, you all know this was seen by many observers and many U.S. citizens as meddling in our elections and a violation of sovereignty, um, which is an important concept to think about in the course. So, you know, one of the questions, uh, one of the jokes that Jay Lennon was talking about was what, why he was going to China in spite of all the human rights violations there. And he said, well, it's all money under the table. Again, referencing the fact that Bill Clinton's campaign was possibly getting money from the, uh, from Chinese nationals there. Um, and in the, in the mid 90s, they were also making the point about Vice President Gore also making a trip to China and calling it the money store, which is a reference to a lending, a payday lending group that they would uh, deal with there. One of the biggest concerns that came in the, in the uh, 20 teens, uh, from about 2010 to 2013 was the rise of Chinese ownership of U.S. debt and investments there, meaning that they had a great deal of, of influence over the U.S. economy, at least many people saw it that way. And again, it raised, you know, the comedians were joke, telling jokes about sovereignty, basically in a globalized world, because the two countries are very interdependent in terms of trade and markets. So sovereign, you know, concerns about who owns what becomes a real issue there.
in the first joke, uh, Leno makes the point that the U.S. went from being a colony owned by the British to a free and sovereign nation now owned by the Chinese, making the point that there was a great deal of Chinese money flowing into firms and property there. And the last joke is even more pointed um, on this, you know, take, you know read that one. I don't want to say the Chinese own a lot of property here, but while driving down Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, D.C., that is, the Chinese president was hanging out the window going, got it, got it, need it, got it, got it, making a point of what he allegedly owned in Washington, D.C. there. And again, this is just a small sample of the jokes that were really concerned about how much Chinese investment there was in ownership of U.S. firms and property. The economic rise issue has always been a concern um, as the United States, um, the U.S. leadership either tries to have trade relationships and tries to have win-win uh, uh, alliances with potential trading nations there. But there's, a real, there's always been a concern that a country as large as China and its population with growing industrial capacity could be a threat to U.S. dominance in the system there. And Jimmy Fallon makes the joke in 2010 that, you know, what, uh, that the idea of who had the biggest economy, everybody assumed China already was there, and that was a surprise. Um, and even jokes about credit ratings and such, the idea that their credit would be better than the U.S.'s, which we were hobbled with a lot of debt at the time. So again, concerns about that economic rise and the economic geographies, because there's a lot of U.S. investment in China for outsourcing and production, but again, how, how powerful are they? One point that U.S.-China relations have always kind of hinged upon is the idea of human rights and human right, perceived human rights violations there. <clears throat> and looking at superiority theory, a lot of the jokes that are told about human rights abuses are often trying to make the point that we feel that our system, the U.S. system is better and it's part of national identity you know, we, we, and values. How do, we, how do we want to keep the U.S. Um, how do we want to run our, how do we, what are, what are the values and how we want to treat our citizens there? And the human rights issues are referenced throughout the data set, specifically the Tiananmen Square incident where a famous iconic picture of a man facing down tanks, uh, this may, may even be in some of your textbooks at this point now, it used to be at least, and may still be there. It talks about the Chinese government encouraging Chinese people to demonstrate outside the U.S. Embassy in Beijing after an incident. Um, and the idea that it's gotta to be tough for the Chinese government to do, because if you get them to come out for a demonstration, that's the last time they did that, they ran over them with tanks, didn't they? Again, clearly referencing Tiananmen Square, this kind of imagery that lives on. And then a more, a, a more, a more critical joke about demonstrators gathering to protest China's repressive government, and yes, funeral services will be held on Friday. The idea that the Chinese government does not tolerate any kind of dissent, and it can be quite deadly if you try to do so. Back to the economic issue. One of the things about outsourcing as China's economy was growing was the reliance of Americans, uh, American retailers on Chinese manufacturing as the basis for what they sold Americans there. And Walmart particularly got a lot of grief for this in the, in the 20 teens, in the 20 teens. And it's, it reflected the, the changing economic geography of um, manufacturing. So we saw deindustrialization, movement of jobs and manufacturing to other countries, and the special economic zones, which we'll talk about in the economic geography section of this course. And it makes the point, you know, Jay Leno's joke to the, to the right, the top one, makes the point, all the U.S. exports are made in China, which is kind of funny, the idea of the exports being made somewhere else there. But also, the jokes were critical of China and Walmart's uh, connections as well, uh, where the joke makes the point, the Chinese president stayed in Blair House to make the Chinese leader feel at home. They had his de bedroom decorated by Walmart, again, making the point that Walmart does billions of dollars of uh, business with Chinese manufacturers as the, as the retailer for those products. Now, Chinese takeout and cuisine uh, in the US is a part of the, often part of the setup for many of these jokes there. Um, and it's kind of important if you think about cultural diffusion, the fact that you know, so many, even small towns, 
um, in rural in in rural areas often will have Chinese restaurants there and Chinese buffets. It becomes an easy joke for the late night comedians to make. Um, talking about economic con uh, competition, the top and the joke on the top about economic sanctions and they're serious, they're gonna start putting MSG back in the food, which there's lots of issues about MSG supp supposedly having a pro being problematic in Chinese food there. Um, in early 2001, there was an incident in which a US spy plane was uh, grounded and had to land on a Chinese island, Hainan Island. And um, the joke is that the US spy plane um, has to come home, they need to come home. It's unclear whether China's gonna return the plane because the that they, they return the people. Um, apparently the Chinese won't return the plane because they won't deliver outside of a 10 block area. Again, making a joke about Chinese food and delivery in the United States there. So again, the joke is referencing, you know, the very diffusion of Chinese cuisine in the United States. So some of the things we should think about if we want to think about why a political geographer would look at popular culture, specifically jokes and humor. Again, as I said earlier in this lecture, that humor is important in group, in maintaining groups. We tell jokes that our group gets, whatever that group is. It could be your best friends joking. It could be teachers joking. It could be your principals. It could be your parents, members. You know, it's, it, allows the joke, it allows the group to have a shared cultural reference and a, and a view. Laughter does work. It is allegedly the best medicine. But jokes often unified the nation, at least the viewers of those late night monologues about those issues. If the jokes are written to elicit laughter. They're trying to make something funny, perhaps a serious, a serious situation not be so threatening there. So there are those who'd argue that the 15 million, 10 to 15 million viewers tuning in every night kind of had a kind of a, a group consensus about what's going on in the globe and, and it reinforced certain things they believed about it and couldn't laugh about it there. These jokes are often ripped straight from the headlines there. So again, Trevor Noah, Samantha B, anybody else who's on late night deliberately has writers looking at the news to try to make the jokes relevant to you and anybody else who's in the audience there. But the jokes throughout the 20 year data set we've got make the point that there were concerns of China as a challenger to US dominance in the world in economic issues, military issues, and even our dependency on Chinese investment and manufacturing to fulfill many things that we want to do in the US like shopping and such there. There is a body of humor theory called disposition theory that you know mines certain stereotypes of China and the Chinese in the US there. And this often is highlighted by our relative ignorance. Most Americans don't know a great deal about China per se. And that's not a criticism, it's just we don't know a lot about other countries in the same way some people don't know much about us. We have to think hard about that we have certain stereotypes in our head and certain things we are more in inclined to laugh at there. So again, these formulaic approaches to jokes and how we're writing about China, it doesn't allow us to dig any deeper. It just makes us feel good about some serious issue there. And the stereotypes keep coming up and we see, we see them over and over again. And I would argue that, you know, if we think about nation, national identity, which you talked about in, in the political geography unit, it's about maintaining a national identity. And these are important things to consider there. I was gonna make the argument that, you know, one of the things that other researchers are looking at uh, besides uh, humor is he's interested in, in uh, many students are on Reddit, uh, political cartoons and our uh, Reddit, subreddit Poland Ball. I'm working, with a, I'm working with a couple of undergraduates here to scrape these and make it to where it's a searchable database there. And I think these are interesting because joke writers and political cartoonists are often highly paid, highly educated, relative elites in a society. Um, they have a lot of power there. If you go to uh, sub, the sub Poland Ball subreddit, these are people like ourselves who just happen to like to draw little uh, ball, little balls with the flags, uh, colored with the flags, and try to make political cartoons and commentary about international issues and history. Um, and I would encourage, you know, this is a project I'm working on. There's other areas that people can look at humor and try to understand how we make national identity through humor.
So again, connections to kind of bring this back to back to back to the course there. Popular culture, and if you've done the cultural, you've done the cultural geography section, we know that popular culture really does reinforce specific worldviews there. Things you get from the media, things you get from your parents, uh, things you get from your textbooks all shape your worldview, you what we would call your geopolitical imagination. And straight out of the AP course guide, culture comprises those shared practices, technology, attitudes, and behaviors transmitted by society. And if we're telling jokes about ethnicities or other countries, that's part of our popular culture and it's part of our geopolitical imagination there. Our popular culture shapes our own sense of national sovereignty there. Many of the jokes that we just discussed are all about the issue of who's interfering with U.S. Uh, activities and our economic activities and our government. And that's a real concern today. And it was with other countries even a decade ago. And lastly, humor and laughter can mark someone as a, in, as a member of that nation there. Jokes are often done along ethnic lines. There's a great deal of research on ethnic humor and it never goes away but it does allow someone to be brought in. And if you're laughing at that joke, perhaps people will consider you as part of that group. Thank you for your time and attention today. Um, if you have any questions, you can find me online at Darren, uh, on Twitter at Prof Purcell or dpurcell at ou.edu. Thank you.